All right, in this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to install the Scale Sound Systems LED conversion kits. These are uh, popular with Atherin locomotives. And uh, I have a guide on the website uh, showing how to assemble and install them, but uh, a video uh, is, would be very useful for a lot of you. So today we have an Atherin ready to run GP40X. Uh, it's going to get a basic sound install, which I'll show later. Um, here are some parts of the uh, LED conversion kit. Uh, the wire, the LEDs, some heat shrink for blocking out the light, the lenses. These are available uh, with pre-wired 1206 LEDs. Um, and uh, that's a popular option for a lot of people who don't want to solder their own. These premium LEDs have got... Uh, are brighter and they have a better color color rendering um, they're available in three temperatures of warm warm white uh, sunny white and bright white um, so since I'm demonstrating how to assemble and install the whole kit I figured I would use the premium LEDs so that everybody could see the whole process from beginning to end so uh, the locomotive the couplers have been removed and it's uh, Free from the frame here. Uh, we're not going to be using this uh, factory PCB, so we can set that aside. And here's the locomotive and uh, shell, and we just pull out the tape. securing the bulbs and they usually just slide right out every now and then there's a, a little bit more adhesive in there uh, so you may have to wiggle them or occasionally the bulb will break apart Um, and if that's the case, you know, you just, you're, you're getting rid of them anyway, so it's not important. Uh, just clean it up and make sure you don't leave any bits of glass laying around on your workbench. Yeah, this one's got quite a bit of adhesive, but it just broke free. Alright, so now that the uh, bulbs are out, we just want to use a toothpick just to kind of make sure, you know, sometimes there's, there's tacky, tacky glue stuck, stuck in the holes or a little bit of adhesive or some, some flash or whatever. Uh, one thing to look out for, the models that have the horn centered over the headlight sometimes the mounting pin of the horn protrudes into the hole just enough that the, the, little, the little bulb would slide in but the lens fitting does not. If you do encounter that um, it's easy enough to just re carefully remove the horn, trim the pin a little bit and then glue it back in. You just want to make sure the holes are nice and open. Uh, you shouldn't have to ream them out any uh, with a file or anything that kind of defeats the purpose of why I designed these kits to be simple and and fast uh, without uh, requiring any modifications so now we're going to solder the wires to the uh, 1206 LEDs and to do that I use common double-sided uh, tape just poke them on there and I will test these quite a bit I've got a double A holder with wires here these premium LEDs uh, the short pad is the anode the positive anode um, so you just want to make sure that they're working out of the package 
and the wire that comes with them. We're going to strip just, you know, a sixteenth or of an inch there off the ends. And um, you don't want to use any kind of flux with these. The flux will boil and destroy the, uh, the LED. I use a common, uh, well this isn't all that common, it's silver bearing, but uh, any kind of small diameter rosin core solder, uh, 6040, you know, anything that's safe for electronics. Um, rosin core is, is, is good to have. Um, you don't have to mess with flux hardly ever, and it's very clean and very fast. So, when soldering these, I use a, I've got my tip temperature almost universally set to 750 degrees, and that sounds high to some of you, but uh, I've done, I'm formally trained in electronics, and uh, uh, components are most often damaged from prolonged exposure to heat not short bursts of heat and the thing that the the success to soldering is to get in and get out as fast as possible while making a good clean joint so what I do here is I just add a little dollop there in the tip and it just touch it I missed <clears throat> I missed that small pad twice there and then you just put the blue wire on the ANO pad. Probably should have had less coffee before I did this. <laughs> now when you handle these LEDs, you know, I not noticed that I picked them up with the tweezers, you don't want to pull them up. These, the solder pads on surface, any kind of surface mount component is uh, fragile. So here I'm just nipping off, you know, whatever little bit of wire might be sticking out of the top. And I will once again test them. So that one looks good. And that one looks good. <clears throat> All right, let's get rid of our tape. Now you've got two options when you go to mount the lens to the LED. If you leave the wire you know parallel with the LED and the lens would then you know be perpendicular forming you know like a 90 degree angle um, that's good for tight areas where you don't want the light fitting to protrude into the shell. Um, for uh, common areas you can you know, you can grasp the LED like this with tweezers and bend it and so that now the, the light tube and the wire run parallel to one another. We'll do it that way for the rear light, which in this instance is the short hood. The long hood is the front headlight for this locomotive. So don't be alarmed. Now, for attaching the uh, lenses to the LEDs, uh, Micromark uh, or Microscale Crystal Clear is an excellent. Uh, it's very strong, and it dries perfectly clear. That's a that's a very good adhesive to use. Uh, canopy glue can also be used. A lot of people love using this stuff. Um, for the sake of speed, 
I'm just going to use good old CA. It uh, it doesn't uh, the CA won't fog up the lenses, so there's no you know fear of that. And uh, it, I have not noticed any advantage in light transmission using any other adhesive. So I generally will just use CA. So now we just pick up. Uh, our lens and set it on. And it only takes a whoops, only takes a few seconds. Now what we want to do is we want to strengthen the entire joint here. We want to make this one strong assembly. Uh, we don't want the wires to uh, to pull up the the PCB pads or anything, so I'm just going to fairly generously run some glue around the sides and the back of it, providing strain relief for the wires, and these will be very strong and durable assemblies when it's all said and done. And again, I'm just going to kick them a little bit here with the... Uh, you know, sometimes I glue these and just let them sit while I work on other things. But to show just how quickly you can uh, work on one of these... dry off. Alright, so now these are nice durable assemblies. Now one thing that I like to do is I like to braid or twist my wires. Uh, it just makes the install a lot cleaner and um, cable management a lot easier. The way that I do this is I've got a piece of cardboard and it has packing tape on it. It just provides a little bit of stickiness to it. Um, a rubber cutting mat can also work. Um, basically anything that has a little, just a little bit of, of, of grip. And then you lay that in there. And then I bring in another piece of cardboard that is also covered in packing tape. And I lay it on top and just spin it. And that right there is a fast and easy way to braid wires uh, for your, your lighting. Uh, this works equally well with the pre-wired LEDs, the real fine, the real fine wire. It's just fast and clean. Sometimes it gets a little bunched up and you just, there you go. All right. So a little, little tip there. All right. So this is, since the front headlight is going in the long hood and there is a speaker that lives there, I don't want a long fitting. And I'm going to test this again just to make sure. Yep. All good. So knowing that I'm going to have a speaker there, uh, I'm going to make this a very compact assembly. So this is the one that we bent at a 90 degree angle. And so I'm just going to grab the fitting and slide it into the holes. Whoops. Um, with the wire going toward the, the roof.
I actually got a little bit of I had just a little bit of <laughs> excess CA there between the lenses which was creating it to uh, causing it to not seat in all the way alright so there's our headlights poking through and it just sits in like that there are multiple ways to block light out and I'm going to show a couple of them for this instance we want to keep this a nice compact area and so I'm going to use um, this tack rubber tack stuff for like hanging up hanging up posters and whatnot. Um, I do like using this stuff it holds the fitting in it blocks the light out and it doesn't uh, dry out or or get brittle or hard over time at least I've not experienced any dry out from it um, So it's just sol it's it's solving a couple of issues here. It's securing the fitting in the in, in the in the shell, and it's also blocking the light out. And I just dress it, poke it in there, and dress it. Like so. And now we'll test. Okay, so I probably will add a little bit of black paint to that. The other way, we've got plenty of room here in the long and the short hood. So these pieces of heat shrink come with the conversion kits. And they will do the bulk of your light blocking. Some people don't mind a little bit of light in the cab or in the shell. Um, I particularly do not care for any light bleed. Um, so I'm more thorough about you know blocking this kind of stuff out. But so you just slip the uh, larger piece around the base and slide the smaller piece in. shrink it down. Uh, you don't want to use a heat gun for this. Um, a heat gun will melt the lens or deform the lens and it could possibly uh, damage the LED even. So just a, a clean iron tip is all you need. And so that would here would be a finished LED assembly. And um, we can see it's kind of interesting. You can see that the short, the windows and the headlight for the short hood are, are still actually in there. So I wonder if we can fish those wires through the headlight holes. That would keep them very nicely Yeah, there we go, look at that. All right, and then again, this will just slide in. I just gotta twist it so that it lines up. There we go. All right. So now that's in. Now that alone will block the majority of the light. However, the 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 crack around the seam of the fitting and the shell will still bleed some light.
So I'm just going to take a look. Yeah, so it looks good out front, but as you can see, there's still a little bit of light there coming out of the crack. So what I do for that, and actually I can just leave the battery connected. I have tried a variety of light blocking paints and materials. Um, the liquid, uh, liquid tape, the Woodland Scenics masking paint, uh, black nail polish. My favorite thing, and what I have found to be the fastest and most effective, is called Dimensional Writer's Tape. Uh, sorry, Dimensional Writer's Paint. Um, it does go under a few different names. I'll show you here once I get my battery leads clipped on. All right, <clears throat> Americana Rider Black. Um, a, a couple of these craft paints make, uh, but you know, it says acrylic dimensional rider. And so, what this stuff is, is it's basically just a very thick, uh, very thick paint that is used for uh, making. I don't know. Uh, I, I guess crafters use it to make like, you know, thick 3D type writing and art and stuff. I don't. I don't really know what people use it for. But it works excellent for blocking light. I use a micro brush, and I just go in there, and you just seal it up. And this will serve two purposes. It will block out the paint, uh, the light. <laughs> And uh, we'll also secure the fitting so you, you don't need to glue it. And it just works, uh, I find it works a lot better than regular paint. It's thicker, it's very opaque, it's more controllable, it won't run. Uh, and so there, now we have no, we have no light leaking out in there. And uh, so we can dis disconnect. That. And then I am going to go ahead and just put some over the uh, tack. And just make everything black in there. The tack. Uh, blocked the light out almost entirely. It, it, there was just a little bit of glowing um, that you probably would never even see, but I've got it and um, you know it just makes it a little cleaner just to make everything black in there. And that's literally it. This um, Atherin ready to run locomotive that at one time had bulbs, now has LEDs with, you know, nice clear lenses. Uh, you're not really focused there that close to the camera. But, uh, you know, it's ready to wire in and do the decoder install. And we'll do that uh, here in a minute once I gather that stuff up. And we're back with the sound install. So uh, this customer, you may have noticed that the uh, road number changed. I'm doing a pair of these, so I just ended up with this shell. Um, same LED conversion that we showed on unit number 7000. So uh, basic components here, the, front, the mechanism with the stock PCB, the shell with the LED conversion we've just done, the scale sound systems drop-in speaker for the GP40X, um, a Loke Sound 5 Direct and a couple of uh, wires for the speaker. Uh, this customer wanted just a very basic 
um, sound and lighting install. There are no uh, ditch lights or action lights or beacons or ground lights or step lights or you know any of that stuff. So uh, this will be a pretty cut and dry uh, installation. Uh, normally with these uh, ready to roll uh, frames uh, that have the clip on PCB I really do like to use the TCS um, RTR motherboard uh, but in this instance the uh, customer was not interested in having any kind of stay alive and um, you know I may use uh, in other instances I would use a Nix Trains Decoder Buddy motherboard with a 21 pin decoder um, I like those uh, they access all of the lighting functions if you have a lot of lighting that is in my opinion the best way to go uh, you know but for this instance we only need the the two headlights um, we don't even need a, any kind of stay alive. Um, the low sound direct uh, in this scenario is the most cost effective way. You could of course use, uh, with the GP40, you could of, of course use a, a Tsunami 2 a PNP in the EMD or if you wanted uh, to spend a little bit less money you could use the Soundtrax uh, Eco PNP which would uh, pop right on here. Again, you'll have to use some kind of adhesive or tape to keep the uh, the decoder on there since uh, the only clip for this type of drive is the the top motor contact. But um, yeah, we'll get started with this and this I'll show you how easy it is to use Scale Sound Systems drop-in speakers. So the first thing that we'll do is release Being careful, of course, not to pull the strip off. If you pull that strip off, a spring and the and the brush will can come out. You don't want to you don't want to do that. Of course, if it does come out, it's it's easy enough to put back in. You just you don't want to lose the spring or the or the top brush. And again, there are there are people who will opt for and these PCB clips I don't I don't use these so we'll just get rid of them uh, there are people who will opt to eliminate the frame pickup so this locomotive the right rail is picked up through the trucks with these two wires the left rail comes through the left set of wheels through the frame to this contact right here and uh, you know the ultimate in reliability of course is to avoid this and to run truck wires down here but um, again this is uh, this is a simple you know I don't want to say budget install because uh, if it were truly budget uh, he wouldn't have opted for the LED upgrade and he wouldn't uh, be putting a sound decoder in it but um, for a high quality LED speaker and sound decoder upgrade this is kind of a budget thing you know there's a lot more labor involved uh, adding the truck wires so with that removed we'll do the speaker first um, the scale sound systems drop-in speaker is uh, it's real simple this is the weight that comes from the factory and uh, I don't know if they've ever released the GP40X's in a uh, factory sound equipped, um, but it doesn't really matter because you can have it with a scale sound systems drop in speaker. We'll just pop those screws out. We don't need the rear screw. So the first thing to do is attach some speaker wire and hopefully I've got lengths that are long enough so just a quick 10 of the wires 
That actually had some solder on it already. But make it nice and clean there. And uh, my speaker uh, tabs are already tinned um, just because this was a. Uh, I was testing it out earlier. So, in this instance, what I'm going to do with these kind of speakers is I'm going to wire. attach the wires going toward the middle you know the common practice is of course to have the speaker the wires come off the end of the speaker but uh, this hole here in the middle of the enclosure facilitates speaker wires keeping them off the uh, drive shaft and flywheel So all we do is pop the speaker wires up through there. Now if I were doing a dual speaker install on this locomotive, <clears throat> I would use black and red wires so that I knew uh, which positive and what the positive and negative of each speaker was. Um, that way I can keep the, the phase of the two systems together. But in this instance, um, it doesn't really matter. And then we'll also run the truck wire up through that little hole. And then using the screws that came out of the weight, all right, looks good. And so now we're ready for the decoder install. Again, since uh, since we don't really have, we just you know have the old uh, Atherin mechanism here with uh, no provision for a PCB. I'm going to use this uh, outdoor mounting tape. I don't think I have. Oh, I do have a package. Various companies make this. Um, I use the Loctite Power Grab. Uh, mounting tape. Uh, it's indoor outdoor. Uh, the uh, 3M Scotch 3M makes makes a similar tape that's red. Um, Gorilla Glue Gorilla makes um, an outdoor mounting tape that doesn't have the red backing, but it's about the same thickness and it's also clear. Um, very very similar. Um, I would discourage using foam mounting tape. Uh, this this foam, uh, over time and in often cases over a short amount of time, uh, deteriorates and crumbles. Um, I will use this only for temporary things. Um, in fact, I usually use it for for attaching my speakers to my test jigs when I'm taking measurements and that kind of thing. It's a temporary. Uh, tape, um, you know, I, I really would discourage using it uh, in a permanent install. Another good option for mounting decoders that doesn't dry out is carpet tape. And uh, it's not always called carpet tape. This is duck brand and it's um, just double sided. Adhesive. I forget exactly what they call it, but it's the same thing as carpet tape. And um, it's double sided and it's very sticky. And um, I have yet, over for years, I've never had any of this dry out or crumble on me. It, is, it has maintained its tack um, <clears throat> for as long as I know of. And I know a few other installers that use it. Um, I actually discovered it in, uh, working in the entertainment industry. Um, but uh, this is a good, this is really good because it's, it's thin, it's real thin. So if you need to keep uh, a very low profile, uh, the thickness of this tape would, would, would push the decoder into the shell or something. This, this can work very well. This is also what I use for the speaker systems, that, uh, the drop-in speaker systems, and even the uh, generic fit speakers that I make, um, mounting in frames and shells and that kind of thing if there are no screw mounts available. So um, you can get this at most of your department stores and home improvement stores. These two right here are, are excellent, two excellent uh, multi-purpose uh, double-sided uh, tapes, mounting tapes to use in a, a whole variety of uh, situations. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to do a double. This stuff is so strong that it really doesn't take a whole lot. Um, and in fact, um, once you've placed the decoder and given the adhesive of a minute to set up, um, it, can, it can become pretty challenging uh, removing it. So it doesn't take a whole lot, but I will, when this is all said and done, uh, use a little bit of capped on tape over the top just to, just to keep everything snug. And we also need to add a motor wire. Probably should have gotten that out before I started this. I keep my scrap wire and a container roughly color coded uh, because you don't always need to pull off of a, a large roll. Alright, so I'm just going to tend this top motor contact. This is the bottom motor wire. This top motor wire I'm just going to tend right there on the inside of that brass contact strip alright now we'll mount, mount the decoder So again, with this being um, a Norfolk Southern locomotive from this era, it is set up for a long hood forward. Um, instead of programming, I'm just, just how I did the color coding of the lights, I'm going to set the decoder in the same way. So this is the front headlight and this is the rear headlight. Traditionally, this is backwards, but in uh, Norfolk Southern's, well, Norfolk Southern slash Southern slash NNW of the well, up into the 90s, I would suppose, when they finally went to uh, short hood. All right. So now a lot of this wire that comes installed in these locomotives has a high oxygen content. The copper, it's not a very good co uh, quality copper. Um, and so you'll often see that it's you know filthy or dirty. If you trim, if you uh, strip back far enough, um, you can usually find some clean copper, and uh, the flux in the solder does ample uh, job cleaning it. And again, you know, whenever you use flux, um, you have to clean the joint afterwards because. Uh, the flux, the the carrier and the flux will corrode the solder joint over time. You've probably seen that as well when you took apart, um, you know, an older locomotive and and the solder joints were corroded and crusty. Uh, that's a result of the manufacturer not cleaning the joint after using flux. I generally just don't use flux to begin with. Um, with clean parts and rosin core solder um, I've, I've never found a need and uh, now not, I can only say never I do use flux on occasion uh, you know and, and it's important to understand that flux uh, flux does not clean the part it simply deoxidizes it uh, you know the, 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 the parts get oxidation from air oxygen and that's all that the flux is doing. It doesn't, you still need to clean the, clean the parts or have clean parts. Um, flux can help circumvent or overcome dirty parts, uh, but that's not what it's designed to do. And um, you'll probably end up with a compromised solder joint. So I'm just tacking the motor wires on right now because I'm not exactly sure which motor wire needs to go where for standard forward operation. 
So those are just going to get tacked on. I've got uh, my rear or my front truck wire. And here we'll tack on the rear truck wire. Again, I'm making sure that I'm getting the base of that copper, letting the uh, rosin, uh, giving the rosin time to do its thing and uh, just slowly getting a good quality tin on that wire so that it doesn't uh, become weak. And truthfully, I would probably, uh, I would normally probably trim these down, but I'm just kind of cruising along here for the sake of, of the video. So now with, well, I'm actually going to do the speaker wires, that way I can hear that. But I will take this to the test bench, the test track, and, uh... Check for direction of operation. Now I've pre-programmed this decoder on the load programmer using the decoder tester. So when it comes time I'll only have minor adjustments to make. All right, let's go test it on the test track. All right, that was the proper orientation. So the top motor strip went to motor negative and the bottom motor contact went to what the PCB calls motor positive. So now I'm just gonna trim these up and dress them. And we'll wrap that around, make sure it's not gonna interfere. We want to make sure that wire doesn't get, uh, won't interfere with the flywheel or any drivetrain there. Whoops. Tuck that wire in. You probably notice that I do use the tweezers a lot for handling things. I've got big fat hands. And uh, I just find it simpler. <clears throat> 
especially for keeping the wires nice and, and small and short so that you don't have a bunch of wires running throughout. There we go. Dress that under. Beautiful. Now at this point, we're done with the center of the decoder. So even though that, uh, you know, I don't know. Because that, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how good those little strips of of uh, double-sided uh, double mounting tape are working. Yeah, I don't know that we need to add any tape. I'm just going to leave it off. Now, since the uh, Loxon Direct has got resistors built in, we don't need to concern ourselves with that. to the board. I don't know if you can hear my cat meowing out there, but... They're used to uh, sitting in here with me. want to be careful that you don't melt adjacent wires insulation <clears throat> there was just a little tip there that I'm just going to trim off of extra wire likewise if you're trimming any wire or anything like that you want to make sure that none of the bits of trimmed wire or solder would, would fall down into the circuit board. That can create a short circuit if it, they land just in the right spot. Um, and then, you know, here you would think that you had a, a perfect install and everything was wired correctly, and then there's a suddenly you've got a smoke generator in your locomotive and you didn't intend to have one there. And there we go. We spent, what, maybe 15 minutes doing the LED conversions and, I don't know, 20 minutes or so doing this decoder install. Uh, regardless, in less than an hour, we took a non-sound ready, um, Atherin ready to run locomotive that was never intended to have sound installed in it. And in less than an hour, we've got LEDs, low sound, and a fantastic sounding speaker installed. And uh, it's just that quick and just that easy. Let's, uh, let's stick it on the track, fine-tune the programming, and uh, see how she sounds. <laughs> 